2 this morning, so if you haven't turned there already, please do so. I knew we were supposed to have quite a few folks out of town this weekend. I had, didn't realize we were going to have this many folks out of town this weekend. Uh, but uh, we do have some visitors with us. We're glad for your presence. Uh, hope that you will uh, benefit from our class and our worship this morning. And uh, if you want to meet the whole church, you're going to have to come back again because uh, uh, lots of folks are, are gone. I hope they can get back home. Uh, there's some places that are kind of... Uh, hard to get around. Uh, Tracy and I went over and ate supper with my mom Friday evening, and coming home, one of the uh, access roads to get from uh, the Grand Parkway on the Interstate 10 was flooded. Uh, if you didn't have a pickup truck, you couldn't get through it. And so, uh, a lot of that going on right now. So, uh, keep in mind, folks that are traveling, uh, if you would. Uh, let's uh, bow and we'll start with a prayer this morning. Our great God and Father, we are mindful of all that you do for us. We offer you our gratitude and our praise as we consider your power and your might and your majesty. Uh, we're reminded of how small we are, especially in times like this where we've seen uh, an abundance of rain and thunderstorms and we watch the world around us and uh, we realize how powerless we are before nature and then to consider that you exercise power over that uh, is, is astounding to us. And uh, more so that you have taken note of us, and that you have made sacrifices for us, that you are patient with us, uh, and that you want a relationship with us. And we are thankful for all of that, for Jesus, uh, for his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. Uh, and uh, the offer of eternal salvation through him. Uh, help us as we worship today uh, that we would uh, honor you, that we would praise you, that we would uh, encourage and edify one another in our determinations to be uh, followers of Jesus Christ. We thank you for those who have revealed your word. We're grateful for James and the things that he has written. We pray as we study this morning uh, that we will do so with a view towards application uh, we are grateful for the practical things in this uh, letter, and we pray that we might be made better because of our study of such. Please continue to be patient with us. Be with those that are unable to be here for illness and those that are traveling today and all those who are affected by the difficulty uh, and the floods that are going on around us. Please forgive our sins. In Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, as we get to James chapter 2, uh, James chapter 2, I guess, is is perhaps the most well-known uh, section of James, especially among our brethren, uh, because uh, for years we have taken uh, James chapter 2, not necessarily out of context, but uh, it, it has been a section of Scripture, especially the second half, uh, that uh, New Testament Christians have used uh, through the years to, to try to address the, the doctrines of uh, faith only and uh, that, that, that kind of Calvinistic mentality and uh, doctrine that goes on. And so we're, we're fairly familiar with this section of Scripture. And uh, there's not anything in here that's exceptionally difficult to understand. I, I do think that there are some parts of this chapter that are exceptionally difficult to apply. Uh, and so as the end of James chapter 1, James had started talking about... Uh, uh, about being uh, looking in the mirror and 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 being people who uh, do the word and don't just hear the word, we see, I guess, perhaps the first major application of that uh, beginning in James two, and there is a bit of a connection, I think, in the last couple of verses. If you remember Wednesday night, uh, we were talking about verse twenty six and twenty seven in chapter one. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted from the world. And then he moves into this section, which has some connections uh, to the last couple of observations that he had made. Uh, we didn't quite finish verse 27 last week, so I want to make sure as we get started this morning if there were questions or comments uh, I, I do want to once again kind of address the mentality. Notice then in verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious, and then again, pure and undefiled religion, 
the idea of religion in those two verses really uh, carries with it the idea of fastidious religion. Uh, someone who considered themselves uh, very, very careful in their application of God's Word. It's not so much a general word as it is a word for people, especially in verse 26, uh, who considers themselves someone who, who is all that God wants them to be. And we did mention verse 26, uh, the, the import and the connection of the tongue uh, to the heart, and that's why I think he uses that illustration. And by the way, we're going to come back to the tongue in chapter 3. James, James does this a lot through this letter. He, he mentions things and then comes back around to them. But verse 27 is a, is a, is a, is a verse uh, that a lot of Christians are familiar with, especially if you grew up uh, in, in the age where institutional issues were raging. If you're my age or older, then you're very familiar with this passage if you grew up uh, in, uh, raised by New Testament Christians in the Church of Christ. Okay, uh, And the reason is because of what it says about orphans. Um, in the context, please understand, all he is saying is, you can tell whether a man is truly dedicated to God uh, because, number one, he pays attention to God's Word, and God's Word says that the greatest commandment is to do what? Love the Lord your God. And the second is likened to it, Love your neighbor as yourself. And as you go back and remember, these people have a Jewish background. If you go back into the old law, God made, put great emphasis in the Jewish nation that they take care of one another in regards to a difficulty and hardship. And, and you have to appreciate that they lived in an economy where the government, uh, uh, non-profit organizations did not set up benevolent kind of institutions to take care of people that were underprivileged, to people that were orphaned, uh, like you see very often not only in our society from a government standpoint, but from just uh, a benevolent, a compassionate standpoint. You didn't have those institutions there. Uh, uh, orphans very often, especially outside of uh, the Jewish culture, uh, were just abandoned and uh, in, in the Greek and the Roman culture, they very often ended up being either slaves or prostitutes, uh, female and male both. And, and you know, you, you find a child that has no connections, uh, you just take them and do what you want to with them. They, they were very abused. Uh, among the Jews, God had always demanded of his people that they take care uh, of, of one another, of widows and orphans. And uh, you can see in a culture where uh, there wasn't always a standing army. I, no, let's not talk about the widow situation for a moment. Uh, and the fact that uh, anybody from any of the tribes at certain points could be called into military service. The, the odds of, a, of, of, of widows being found in the, in the society was much greater than in our society where you find widows uh, just because of the natural circumstances of life. Okay? Uh, and uh, in that economy, you didn't find as many opportunities for women to work. In fact, very few for them to make their own living, especially in the Old Testament age. And so it was expected among God's people to care for one another because, after all, the Jews were just a big family. Okay, And the same is true in regards to orphans, even to the point of the Leverite Law, which addressed if, if a woman was widowed, uh, that uh, her husband's brother was to take her as wife, not only for her sake, but also to raise up children uh, so that the brother would not lose his inheritance. And so this has always been a part of God's law for his people. And that's the application, okay? If you want to find out if somebody's really, really religious, see how they treat people who are misfortunate, especially widows and orphans who in that economy just had very few options otherwise. And, and the word visit doesn't simply mean go by and check on them, obviously. It means, means to support them. The reason I think it's more familiar for us, uh, for many of us who grew up associated with uh, Christianity and fundamental Christianity, is because uh, during the divisions that you saw among churches of Christ and brethren back in the uh, post-World War II, uh, Orphans' homes and congregations taking money from their treasury to support such 
uh, became a fairly hot-button topic. What's interesting about that is for years and years, congregations had set aside things uh, and sent them off to orphans' homes. What happened in the post-World War II is that that became a very organized effort on the part of some churches. And uh, as brethren tried to determine and discuss and debate the, uh, the, the uh, scripturality of that process, this passage became very well known, okay? Uh, and I have heard people use this passage on both sides of that argument to try to say, well, this says that we're supposed to do it and how we do it doesn't matter. And others would argue, look, this is individual activity here. You can see because of keeping oneself unspotted from the world. I, I just want you to appreciate that those are not bad uses of this passage. But that's not why James wrote this verse. Okay, He wrote this verse because what he's trying to accomplish is that folks like you and I don't claim to be religious while we're ignoring certain aspects of religion that God considers very, very important. And, and that's the primary application. Not, not that the other applications are not good and useful and helpful, but it's real easy to look at that and say, well, I... You know, this is my view about uh, uh, institutional issues and church-supported orphans' homes, and so just dismiss this passage altogether. I don't care what your view is about that. If we are not sensitive to those that are less privileged, who are in need of help, and we're not helping them as best we can help them, then we are violating this commandment. And, and we need to not just pass over it because it's been used in other ways and act like that we don't, we don't have uh, any responsibility in this. Now, does this mean I need to go find a widow or an orphan to take care of? No, not necessarily. But we have widows in this congregation. And the question that we ought to all ask ourselves is, are we, are we sensitive to that? Do we pay attention to the ladies here who are uh, no longer married, no longer have a husband? Or are we doing what we can, and not even among our congregation, but in society in general. Uh, and, and I think as Christians, especially, and I don't, I'm not trying to isolate or rule out anybody, but this is what I've seen in my lifetime. If you came out of an institutional background where you were always a part of congregations that were sending money from the church to support, uh, whether it's a missionary society or an orphan's home or a college, what happens very often is the mentality develops that. I put my money in the plate. The church is doing that, so I don't have any responsibility. I had someone actually make that point to me about orphans' homes. We were discussing it, and he said, look, I put my money in the plate. I've done all God tells me to do. And, and I think that's a gross misrepresentation of what God wants from us, and that is fundamentally the issue with anything that becomes institutionalized, when we think that the group is to do it, so I no longer have obligation. James is writing long before any of that's an issue, and what he's telling folks like you and I is, if, if our religion is true, then, then we need to pay attention to these kinds of things. We need to be sensitive to people that are in need. And then he goes on at the end, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, which is equally important. Okay, that's one that we tend to think of more often as indicative of true faith in God. Uh, but the reality is, it's not just am I living a holy life, it is also am I living a life that's holy and I'm trying to be a light in this world and help people that are in need. Okay, And, and James moves from there to chapter 2, and I keep saying there's a connection here, because he goes from one instance where... In your day-to-day -day activity, practically, you're showing that you're following the Lord. And it goes to another that is equally uh, an issue with us. Okay, So as we move into chapter 2, questions or comments uh, about verses 26 or 27 before we move forward? Okay, uh, Sam.
Sure, sure. Uh, could, could you hear what Sam was saying, pretty much? Uh, and that's, that's an example of how, in our day and age, that this can be practiced. Just the fact that someone has somebody to feed them and clothe them doesn't mean our responsibility is over. And, and it's not only for their benefit, but for ours as well. well. What does this kind of activity do for us? Okay. Yeah. You, you feel like that you're contributing to the work? Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think as much as any, any kind of service that's focused on others helps us to be less self-centered and less selfish uh, and, and, and helps us to deal with our own issues. I, I tell you, it's not hard to find somebody who's got things worse than I have them. You know, when I get thinking, oh, man, things are so bad, it doesn't take me very long to find somebody that's in a lot worse circumstance than I am. And uh, you, you, you learn gratitude, you, you learn appreciation for others, you learn how to encourage other people. A lot of benefits here, not only for the person receiving it, but for the person giving it. And that's why true religion and undefiled, really pure service to God uh, is seen in these kinds of activities. And so, uh, uh, and, and I, there are a lot of very uh, benevolent people in our world and in, among our brethren, but I do think that culturally, uh, and uh, generally, we're moving away from this idea of looking out for other people and taking care of them unless there's a flood. Now, if there's a flood, everybody jumps in, you know, but day to day, th that's, that's harder to do, and uh, it is something that we need to be doing. As we get to chapter 2, and, and let, let's just go ahead and read through the first uh, uh, 13 verses because this is kind of the connection here. Uh, and the first section in chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. The, the older versions read, with respect to persons. Uh, if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. He who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, th this treatment of, of the underprivileged is the connection between these two. Uh, the, the instruction is, is very simple, very straightforward. Uh, I think particularly uh, to the Jews, this would be instruction, although it's kind of interesting to me that James addresses bias uh, uh, in, 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 in the Jews not with regards to race or culture. Why would you expect a New Testament writer to address the Jews in, respard, in respect to race or culture? Yeah, be, because they're Jews. The fact that they are designated as an entirely separate group of people from everyone else. I mean, they looked at it this way. There's not Americans, Europeans, Asians. You know, they didn't look at it in continents. They didn't look at it in countries. They didn't look at it in skin color. You were a Jew or you were a Gentile. Everybody else was a Gentile. 
And you see those prejudices and if people that have studied the Bible together like we all have, uh, we see how, how much those prejudices affected things in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That didn't go away for Christians in the first century. Okay? You, you know, a Jew becomes a Christian, they're still a Jew. And, and, and they bring, as we mentioned last week, their own bag of rocks, their own baggage, their own... Uh, you know, rose-colored glasses to Christianity with them, and now they're having to confront things that have always been natural, and some of which actually were things God designed and, and, and for other purposes, and now they're having to deal with them. You would think if James was going to write to these new Christians who with a Jewish background about bias, what he would say is, look, you can't have the faith of Christ with respect to persons. You can't treat Gentiles like they're dogs. But that's not where he goes. Uh, what he says is, if there comes into a, your assembly a man in gold rings and fine apparel, and then there comes a man into your assembly who basically is a beggar and, and looks and smells like it, do you treat him the same? Uh, I want to make a couple of observations as, as we kind of look at this in more detail. Number one, look at verse 1, how it starts, and then again verse 5, how it starts. How does James begin addressing this issue? Uh, and uh, th this is something that, that I, I have to work on. Uh, and, and for anybody who's in a position of teaching, uh, correcting, admonishing, leading, uh, it, it is a, a valuable thing to remind the people that you're talking to that we're all in this together. Okay, that there is affection here, that James is not looking down his nose as if he has no problems, and that these people are just horrible folks. He identifies himself with them. And my suspicion is James fought the same stuff. Okay, uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, notice in verse one that he starts off when he addresses the Lord Jesus Christ, he addresses him how? The, the Lord of glory, or the glorious Lord. Why, why do you think he does that? Yeah, I think, he, I think this is a reminder of who Jesus is and was and what he did in spite of that. Philippians chapter 2 talks about Jesus giving up or, 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 or considering his equality with the Father not something to be held on to. And, and thus he came to the earth, uh, took on flesh, uh, gave himself to mankind, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Uh, and when Jesus was on the earth, what's very clear is he, he is accepting of sinners. In fact, that's what the Pharisees very often criticize him about. Luke chapter 15, he, he eats with sinners and tax collectors. Well, uh, remember how the Jews looked at physical, material circumstances as it related to spiritual circumstances. If you were blessed, if you were wealthy, for many of Jews, especially if you were wealthy and you looked like you were pretty religious, what did they assume? God smiled on you, but if you... If you were blind, if you were lame, if you had a disease, if you were a leper, if you were poor like the rich man in Lazarus' story, then in their mind, what? You're a sinner. Uh, God's rejected you, and that's why he's treating you this way. And, and by the way, if you ever wonder uh, how they got there, uh, actually, in, on a national level, back in uh, both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God makes the point, if you're faithful, I'll bless you. If you're unfaithful, I'll curse you on a national level. But it's very easy when you think of that in terms of national things to start applying it individually, and that's what the Jews did. And so I think some of this particular admonition grows not only out of the Jew-Gentile thing, but also more especially out of the, well, this man walked in, this man is, he's got it together, he's living a good life, he's blessed by God, uh, he's wealthy, he's got all the trappings of such, he's a respectable man, we need to treat him with respect. And then here comes somebody wandering in, and the first thing you think is, what do you want and are you lost? Not lost spiritually. And 
And I tell you, those are dispositions we still have. Uh, bias. I, I hear people all the time argue about, especially in racial issues, about racial bias, and some people are biased, and some everybody's biased. As far as I'm concerned, everybody is biased. Now, some people have done a much better job of overcoming it than others have, but I think it is a very natural thing to look at people that aren't from where you're from, don't look like you, don't have the same background, maybe don't have the same skin color, maybe not in the same socioeconomic circle, and it is a very natural thing to separate yourselves from people that are different than you. And I say that because bias is something all of us have to be sensitive about. And I think that's why James is writing this. Uh, and, and I think economically maybe is, is more, a, a more common bias than any other bias is. Because all of us like to deal with people that we consider to be respectable, and none of us are comfortable dealing with people that we're not comfortable being around because of their circumstances. And so James just tackles this thing straight on. And the illustration is very easy to understand in verse 2. Somebody shows up for worship is the way we would say it. And by the way, uh, just for your benefit, if, if you're not aware, the word assembly in verse 2 is the word synagogue. You know, most of the time in the New Testament, the word assembly is the same word as what? Anybody? Same word as church. It's ecclesia. But in James, and this gives you some uh, glimpse into how early this letter is and who the people are that are receiving it, this is almost exclusively written to Christians who are Jews, and this is probably early in the spread of the gospel. So when he talks about their assembly, he, he talks about it in Jewish terms. It's a synagogue, okay? Uh, and and all, that, all a synagogue means is a meeting together, okay? So in your assembly, you're, you're gathered together for worship. Two people walk in to visit. And, and by the way, this must have been much more common than we think of. Paul mentions it in Corinthians when he's talking about how you use your gifts. Uh, here somebody comes to the assembly, and if you're all speaking different languages and nobody's interpreting, he's going to think you're a bunch of nuts, okay? So, so here's the same picture. Somebody walks into the assembly, he's got all the trappings of wealth and blessing. Gold rings, uh, fine, uh, bright apparel, and then here's another guy walks in, and, and, and uh, my version, the New King James, and the, uh, uh, this is a uh, Holman uh, uh, version, translates it filthy, but, but it, it can mean vile, ragged, shabby, uh, all of those are proper uh, definitions of the term. Uh, a poor man in, in filthy clothes. And, and what? What conclusions do you draw? Let's just stop for a second and say, you got these two people. If they were standing right up here, what conclusions would you draw? You know, let's, let's, let's talk about our biases for a second. What conclusions would you draw? Here's somebody dressed up, looking nice, gold rings. Here's somebody over here, looks like uh, what we'd call a homeless person living, under, uh, living in a van down by the river. Is that the way that that... <laughs> In fact, did you hear what did you hear what uh, Suzanne said? Uh, uh, you, you know, we regard them in a certain way, right? Uh, what assumptions do we often make about that person? Do what? They're looking for a handout, Curtis. Okay, the, they they probably don't want to work. You ever, huh? I was going to say, do you ever, you ever associate that with drugs or alcohol? Uh, maybe mental illness. In this day and age, we, I mean, people are much more conscious of that. Uh, so you think of all the conclusions you draw. Now, are those necessary conclusions? No, they're not necessary conclusions. Why do we draw those conclusions? 
they, they are often true, but are they necessary? No, they're not. I mean, what if they, what if it, I mean, where I grew up, what if he's a farmhand that just walked in off of a 10-hour shift working on tractors and, and cotton gins and he's wearing raggedy old jeans and he stinks and he, and, and, and I mean, I've seen, I've worked with people. That, that looked just like they, they rolled out from under an underpass. But we've been working all day. And that's my point. Those aren't necessary conclusions. It, does common sense tell us this is often the case? Yes, it does. There's no question. But it is biased when you draw conclusions without evidence. And, and then what about the person that's all dressed up and nice? What do we think about them? Successful? I'm sorry? What'd you say? Is he a drug dealer? Yeah. Uh, this one sells to this one. Uh, well, I wore my nicest jacket today. Thanks, uh, Phyllis. Is that, is that where I am today? Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. What do you draw? What conclusions? With evil thoughts, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, but do you do that with the person that's dressed nice? Do you assume ungodly things about them? I, I, would, I would propose more often than not you think, here's somebody that works hard, here's somebody that's wise with their money, here's somebody that's probably a nice person, somebody that's engaging or they wouldn't be successful... I mean, we draw all those positive things just from appearance. But as Phyllis said, you know, for all we know, they could be a drug dealer, like Larry. Look at Larry. Larry's a drug dealer, you know. Uh, if you're watching on live stream, Larry is a retired pharmacist, okay? This is the problem with the world we live in now. You can't make an inside joke without having to explain it. The point I want you to see is we still do this. And we would do it if it happened this morning. And that's the tendency we have. And I think Suzanne's right. Part of the tendency is because generally or very often you, you, those things are associated with that. Now, now, what can you not tell about either one of those people? You cannot tell anything about their standing before God or their interest in spiritual things. You know, they both walk into the assembly uh, and, and you think, well, this guy's looking for a handout. Well, what if this guy's looking for votes? I've watched, I have seen people visit this congregation before who were politicians in town who were running. It's the only time I ever saw them in this building. Now, I don't know that that's why they were here, but buddy, they shook every hand in the place. Okay, and, and so it's just as easy to assume improper motives about the wealthy guys it is about the poor guy what we don't know is they're standing before God and what we have to assume is that they're interested in spiritual things they wouldn't be here that has to be the assumption we choose and so that's James's point uh, you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes you say to him sit here in a good place and remember they had seats that were kind of reserved for guests of honor things like that but then the other one, you say, you stand there. And there's a, every, the, 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 the point of that is everybody else would be sitting. We don't want you sitting with us. Stand over there to the side. Or sit down here at, 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 on the floor uh, underneath, you know, at the foot of somebody's chair. And, and, you know, I can't imagine doing that. But I've seen and I've probably been guilty of having that in my mind. And so, James's application in verse 4 is, have you not shown partiality among yourselves? Have, have you not been unfair? Have you not shown a, an appreciation for one as opposed to the other without using the proper measuring stick? Okay? I mean, there, there may be partiality deserved. If, if you're looking at it economically, certainly. But our measuring stick is... 
we're all created by God, we're we all sinners, we're all in need of salvation. And, and so he said, you've shown partiality among yourselves and you've become judges with evil thoughts. You have drawn conclusions that are not in evidence just based on what they look like. And uh, that's, that's something we all have to deal with, folks, uh, not just in the assembly. You know, this, this applies all the time. And, and I have the same... Of course, I don't, I don't even want to be around the guy in the fancy clothes, much less the, the other one. I just don't want to be around anybody. But it is so easy as you go about day to day to draw those conclusions about people without thinking about them from a spiritual standpoint. And, you know, part of our maturation as Christians is we start looking at people relative to their standing before God. And if we don't know what that is, maybe we need to do better about finding that out. Yes, ma'am. Dorlene? Oh, there's no question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's why I say it, bias, is, bias is something everybody deals with. You're exactly right. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, clicks, your point is clicks form. Uh, and that's, that's true. And uh, we need to be conscious of it. You've become judges with evil thoughts. And that should stick in our head. Uh, and so, interestingly enough, the way that James addresses the correction here is uh, kind of a curiosity to me. Verse 5, listen, and once again, my brethren, I'm, I'm not just beating on you. Uh, and uh, I think, once again, James likely had to deal with these same biases because he had the same background. Um, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? This probably goes directly against the Jewish thinking that if you're poor, if you're diseased, if, if, if you have something wrong with you, you're blind, you're lame, whatever, that God has cursed you. And... And so James just point blank says, don't you recognize that this is who the gospel really appeals to the most? Uh, and I, that's why I think he says God has chosen the poor in the world, rich in faith. Not just because they're poor, but because very often people who are uh, in some way in this world uh, underprivileged find the most hope in the gospel because they've realized there's not a lot of hope in the here and now. And uh, you, you see that in Jesus' life, folks. You know, the, the religious people, John chapter 9, Jesus tells the Pharisees, yeah, y'all are the blind ones. It's not, it's not the blind man and these other people that see the miracles and recognize who I am, that God is with me. It's all you religious folks who think you've got it all figured out and everything's right with God. You're the ones that are really the blind ones. Uh, the gospel appeals to, to people who are less privileged. And so I think that's the idea in verse 5. Um, God has chosen the poor of the world, rich in faith, uh, to be heirs of the kingdom. That doesn't mean the rich in the world, rich in faith, are not heirs as well. But the point is, you can't dismiss the poor. If he, if he shows up to your assembly, the chances are pretty good. He's going to find more appeal in the gospel than someone for whom life is all good. Notice, by the way, I mentioned that James comes back to things over and over. If you go back to chapter 1, you remember uh, when he was talking about uh, learning to take, uh, to, to grow in your faith because of difficulties uh, in his illustration in verse, uh, oh, where is it? Verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. This is an image that James comes back to a time or two uh, through this letter. Uh, because it's an image that we are not always comfortable with, okay? A lowly man, uh, a beggar man, uh, even if he has faith. B but verse 6 is where I find it interesting. Uh, you've dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do not they blaspheme the noble name by which you're called? When you get to chapter 5, he's going to talk about the rich oppressors again. Probably people that aren't Christians is what he's got in mind here. And it gives you a little glimpse into what Christians in the first century were probably dealing with, especially Jews. Because the wealthy among the Jewish people, especially as you see in the early chapters of Acts, they are among the ones that are 
pushing the persecution of Christians. Uh, we know it's because the, it's the Sadducees. The Sadducees tended to be the party in charge that were connected to the Romans, that were very physical-minded, uh, temporally-minded, didn't believe in, in some of the spiritual things that God had revealed in the Old Testament, and, and generally were very wealthy people, and they used their wealth that way. Pharisees were, to a lesser degree, but, you know, when you read Acts, you look at the first ten chapters and the persecution of Christians, it's always the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we forget about the economic conditions as well. Uh, and uh, you, you pick up almost any scholarly work about James, uh, and they will mention, uh, again, you have to appreciate that very often early in Christianity, it was, the, it was not just Jew versus Christian. It was a lot of wealth versus poverty that was uh, behind some of the persecution. Okay, So, interestingly enough, what he says is, aren't these rich people that you're fawning over, don't they tend to be the ones that cause you the most trouble? Uh, I, here's the reason I find that kind of ironic. God also tells us, you know, to love our enemies, bless those that curse you. And yet James turns around and says, you know, the people that you're, that you're kowtowing to are the same ones over here that for the most part are the ones that are mistreating you. It's just kind of an odd observation to me. And yet, again, when you get to chapter 5, he, he comes back to this idea uh, and he actually speaks to the rich, weep and howl for your miseries because... Your garments are corrupted and you've abused people that are working for you. Uh, he's telling the Christians here, these same people that will turn around and abuse you are the people that you are fawning over. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Uh, it's an interesting argument uh, to me. Uh, and, uh, but I think when you get to uh, the end of verse 7, they drag you into courts and then into, I mean, end of verse 6 and end of verse 7, they, they not only blaspheme you, but what's a bigger deal is they blaspheme the name of the Lord. And this may once again come back to this idea of the Lord of glory. Uh, are you, are you going to fawn after people that, that so consider your Lord this way? Uh, verse 8 and 9 following is either uh, James anticipating an argument well, we treat this rich person this way because we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Or James is just pursuing his own train of thought and saying, if that's what's going on, not that you're making this as an excuse, but this is what's really happening. You're trying to love everyone. Uh, either way is acceptable in the text. There's no way to tell which James is uh, addressing. But, but notice the, the key word in verse 8 is really. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, and the royal law is the royal law because Jesus said this is the second greatest commandment. Uh, the king said that. Um, you shall love your neighbor yourself. If that's really what you're doing, then great. Have at it. Uh, you know, you're really not necessarily being unkind to the poor man. You're just trying to be kind to the rich man even though you recognize he may be a kind of an enemy. It uh, doesn't make sense, but that's what James anticipates. But verse 9, but if you show partiality, okay, if you're treating them differently, if you treat them the same, then great, because you're trying to love. But if you're treating differently, uh, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And Wednesday night, uh, we'll talk about where he goes from there because it's uh, compelling. And then we'll move on to the second part of chapter 2, okay? Thanks for your comments and participation this morning.